Okay. Hi, I'd just like to make a short announcement before the panel is starting. So um, I'm a Cognizio member, uh, I mean, a member of uh, AESC junior uh, researcher. And each uh, two years we are having a student conference, so young researchers conference. Uh, and I would like to invite you to be um, in, um, subscribe maybe on the uh, newsletter that you can find on the ESC website. So if you go down here, you're going to have this place when you can subscribe on the newsletter. And oh, merci. I didn't look at the screen. <laughs> okay. Let's put more here. So, yeah, so here is the place and you can subscribe to the newsletter. So the next uh, next Conicio uh, is going to be like next summer. We didn't like uh, fix the thematic yet, but uh, Themat thematics that we had like the past years were like affective minds, uh, decision making, um, non-human minds. So that's our, some of the thematic that we had, and uh, that's it. So I, I hope you're going to be there like next uh, next summer. Oui, alors ça va être plus facile pour moi aussi. <laughs> oui, alors Conicio, dans le fond, c'est un colloque étudiant qui euh, se déroule à chaque deux ans, dans le fond, en alternance avec l'école d'été, ici à l'UQAM, à l'Institut des sciences cognitives. Et donc, euh, on organise ce colloque-là euh, avec des thématiques, comme je viens juste de dire, là, qui sont très liées avec euh, l'école d'été. Donc, on a déjà eu donc euh, la cognition des émotions. Euh, euh, par exemple, ça, c'était euh, l'année dernière. Donc, ça fait plus que dix ans qu'on organise le colloque. Donc, on vous invite à, à vous tenir au courant en vous abonnant à la, au bulletin qu'il y avait sur le, le site web de l'ISC. Euh, et puis, sinon, ça va apparaître dans les activités aussi de l'ISC si vous allez vers l'onglet « Activités ». Et puis, ça va être probablement en juin euh, l'année prochaine, donc juin 2019. Merci. Thanks. Um, so welcome everyone to the last official panel of the of the course. Um, the panel's title is Others in Mind, um, but I think uh, Stephen said it would be fine for this to really be just sort of open to um, discussions of things that you think are relevant to the three presentations that we heard and especially themes that might um, cut across uh, different things that multiple uh, of the panelists uh, had talked about. Um, so in keeping with um, the format, uh, we are going to start out by having each panelist um, just sort of give a, a, a very short, um, maybe one minute description of what you presented about earlier. Um, and then we'll spend some time um, with uh, open, giving an opportunity for the panelists to discuss uh, with each other. And then we'll open it up uh, for general questions after that. So Jennifer. Right, one minute. I think that squid have, and I don't think the term theory of mind is a good one. I think they have a concept of what the other is thinking, and I believe, but I'm not sure, that they don't just think about the other in terms of the other conspecifics. They are in such danger both from conspecifics and from other species, that they always have to think about, I'm watching, what am I watching for? What is this animal going to do if I let it? What else should I do? At the same time, I think when it comes to sexual behavior, they also have an assumption of the motivation of other individuals. There, that was one minute. Okay, um, I think, um, non-human primates, especially the old world, old world monkeys, um, are very sophisticated in their social behavior, social cognition. And I think, uh, you know, if you think about it, without having uh, such a, uh, um, uh, advanced social cognition, their ethological setting just doesn't, doesn't allow you to survive. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they have a very similar neural mechanisms that guide their social decisions. Um, yet, there's a you know difference. Uh, there are limitations in a way that uh, uh, look uh, like much less than humans, um, and I don't think anyone quite knows why that's the case. Um, um, I think that will be an interesting thing to discuss. I mean, since we're talking about theory of mind, you know, monkeys don't really pass full full array of theory of mind tasks. Um, and there's also an interesting thing I can talk to you about, about uh, the mirror neuron testing in monkeys. Um, it only passes if 
if you tell them it's relevant to you to kind of pay attention to the right way. So I think they have a lot of you know, uh, basic mechanisms for high level social cognition, thinking about others, considering others, um, but maybe it's not quite to the level of um, 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 full equipment like uh, we do in humans. I'll take this, make the microphone might be easier. Um, yeah, my talk was the first one this morning, and I see a couple of faces which weren't here at the first presentation, which might be fine. Um, so uh, let me tell you very briefly what I have been talking about. So my the question I addressed this morning is whether birds have a sort of higher order cognitive abilities. With that, I meant whether they are able of things like abstraction and rule learning, whether they can detect similarities between visual or auditory objects based on the underlying structure, the underlying pattern of those stimuli, rather than by the physical instantiations from which this pattern can be abstracted. So I gave a number of examples of that in rule learning and in, in, in zebra finches and butchery cars, where you train them with a number of examples and then you test them with sounds they have never heard before, but which have the same structure, whether they recognize that pattern or not. Uh, turns out that with this problem and some other problems, um, there are species differences in these sorts of uh, things. Uh, there is evidence, which I hope I presented this morning, that some species are able to really abstract underlying regularities and can classify stimuli in that way rather than by physical similarity. But it is also the case that other species seem far less able to do so. And it might not be an absolute difference between being able to do that and not being able to do that. There might be some sort of intermediates there, which is very intriguing in what that really means in terms of cognitive processes. So that was a very brief summary. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, at this point, I'd like to invite the panelists to um, share if they have any reactions to some of the other presentations from the, their fellow panelists. Um, so. This is for you, Carol. Is there any reason why this should be the abstraction that matters to birds? How do you know there aren't other situations and other variables? Um, so what exactly do you mean whether, when you say, are these the abstractions? Well, you have looked at pattern in song. Yeah. And it really doesn't seem to be consistent. And of course, we have another problem that birds represents a fairly large number of species. And from what I can see, the individuals that you picked were choices of convenience so that you haven't looked at the role that evolution might play. Mm -hmm. but, but why this one? How do you know there aren't other abstractions that they may compute? Well, they might, they might well do. So it is, in a way, arbitrary, the, the uh, direction of my experiments, because they are inspired by things that uh, have been tested in primate species and have been tested in humans uh, in terms of abilities of abstraction. So they formed the starting point for my research rather than the natural behavior of these birds, which may provide other entries to look at uh, sort of higher order cognitive abilities. So in a way, it was a matter of convenience by going this route rather, road rather than another one. I wondered whether you thought that because they sing this kind of vocal output and perception of vocal output was an important part of their lives and therefore that was the place that you would find it. Yeah, well, that, that's actually something which I did mention in my talk. So why, why use vocal structures uh, to look at in birds? And that is because, uh, yeah, I'm also interested in, in, in language and language evolution. And the key feature of language is that it's guided by grammar rules of all sorts at diff different levels. And the question is, and you don't find anything like that in our 
related species. So the question is whether you find anything like that in other species which also show vocal learning and complex vocalizations. And that's where the birds come in, because they have that. So that's also a reason for using these specific features and examining them in birds. Now, there is actually uh, talking about the structure of bird vocalizations. So uh, Chomsky, the great linguist, yeah. he actually de uh, discovered or made this system which is known informally as the Chomsky hierarchy of grammars. So different yeah. levels of complexity in computations and you can fit various languages on this hierarchy and see what sort of level of complexity they have. You can do the same thing with the vocalizations which are produced by animals, uh, whether it's a bird song or a whale song or a primate uh, series of sounds. You can plot them there and then see whether the structural similarities or the structures you find in these natural vocalizations where they fit into this hierarchy in relation of complexity in relation to language. And uh, it seems that they are mainly concentrated on the very lowest level, which is a sort of Markovian linear uh, predictability, uh, a predictable grammar pattern, rather than having any more complexity. But it raises the question, even though they don't show any more complexity in their own vocalizations, do they have the cognitive ability to uh, detect more complex structures? So that's also what motivates our work. Thank you. Ahead, yeah, maybe Carol. I can ask you a question. Uh, I mean, we, we did briefly discuss that at, at uh, uh, a meal we had together a couple of days ago, but uh, I'm, I'm still intrigued by this issue of the squid which have this bilateral pattern and uh, where they're signaling in one side uh, with a particular display color pattern and on the other side with another color pattern. And um, yeah, I'm still wondering whether you ascribe that to a sort of higher order awareness or cognition or whether it might be possible, as I argued and would still argue, that it had something to do with this bilateral organization in which one eye seems to affect one side of, or it's perceiving one side of the world, the other eye, the other side of the world, and the connection between them is actually not very prominent. And it could be that what they see in one eye motivates one part of the body, but they see what the other eye motivates the other part of the body. Uh, could there be something like that going on? Tough question. There might be. Now, I should say, by the way, that all the cephalopods have lateral eyes. They do have, especially with the cuttlefish, when they're feeding, they bring the eyes forward a little bit and they have binocular vision for prey capture, but mostly it's lateral perception. And the early learning theorists were studying uh, categorization of shapes. And one of the studies they did is they showed shape discrimination and had the animal learn it through one eye. And then they tested fairly immediately with the other eye and they found out that the octopus had not passed the information across the brain so that they didn't know it, quote, when tried with this eye. But they came back the next day and they discovered that the storage, whatever it might have been, had become bilateral. Okay, so it was a temporary thing, not a permanent thing. Um, oh, you're a bird researcher. This will do just fine. Many birds, I don't know if it's all birds, but many birds are bilateral period, that the information simply doesn't move to the other side of the brain. So if that were true, if there were something about bilateral storage and bilateral perception, then the bird should do the same thing. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. Um, they, um, they can't express, of course, as obviously, immediately, 
in uh, with doing two different things which each side of the body as the squid as the squid can uh, can do so that might be a difference in their ability to express it but do you ever see a situation where you have taught the bird a perceptual task of some kind or a motor task of some kind and it has stored information in one side of the brain and the information simply doesn't move to the other side of the brain and therefore the animal can't perform when tested on the other side? Um, well, it's not the case that, that, that it's impossible for information to travel to, right. uh, uh, from one side to the other side. It's just that the left eye projects in the right side completely of the yep. brain and the other way around, rather than with us that they project on both hemispheres, our right. eyes. Um, but that doesn't mean that after it has been going to one side of the brain, it doesn't enter the other side of the brain. I mean, there are cross connections in the bird brain. Right. So the information can be transferred from one side to the other side. It's just that the eyes are really, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, providing information to one side only. Right. So if, let's say, your bird made a discrimination that the information of which had been fed to the right eye, mm -hmm. and then you tested to see if the information was available to the left eye. Yeah, well, they would have it been, be? Yeah, they, um, um, now I should dig in my memory uh, for a long time ago. So there have been experiments in the past with chicks, yeah. they old chicks, which, uh, um, in which they put a cap on one eye and then with the other eye they were trained to peck for instance on, on red grains to to well, I'm as, as a food and then um, they uh, so they had to learn that task and then they were tested with only the other eye and they had a big problem in then performing that task when the information was only coming from the other eye so there is a problem with, uh, yeah, with certain types problem of Problem with transfer. Yeah, 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 yeah. But maybe you know more about it. But in that, in that experiment, um, if this was done in a developing chick, yeah. then it becomes a little bit unclear whether the learned information is not transferred or because of, uh, you know, monocular, you know, deprivation, the, just the visual system was developed kind of funny. Yeah, well, in that experiment, uh, uh, those were chicks in which up to that experiment, they could see it through both eyes. So it didn't have to do anything with, uh, with the development. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is, I think that there is something very interesting going on here because the displays have a different motivational base. And it, it seems to me that somehow or other there must be some, it's not a bilateral specialization, because in fact, if you have, and I never have enough hands, if you have a male here and the females here, and he's making one of these lateral silver displays so that this side is all white, if he smoothly switches around to the other side because there's somebody coming from there immediately, he changes sides. So it's not a side specialization. Either side can do it equally competently. And in fact, very, very quickly they change. You can watch them sort of slide around and it, it says so, bam, it changes. So it's, it's something different and I don't know how they do it. But it does intrigue me because if you are going to say, well, you have an aggressive motivation, so you show an aggressive display, maybe that's some kind of automatic link between affect and skin display. And then you say, but wait a minute, over here, you're doing a different kind of display, so you must be able to express two different motivations at once. So it can't be some kind of automatic link. I mean, it's also possible that uh, because their nervous system in the cephalophods are kind of very distributed, um, maybe it's possible, it's, maybe it's not that different than we're moving one arm this way, we're moving the other arm that way, um, right? Just uh, controlling uh, different nodes 
uh, in a different ways. Well, the problem with the different movement in humans is that drummers know that if you're trying to express two different rhythms at once, it's fit. any drummers in the audience? It's very, very difficult to produce two completely different rhythms, correct? But good drummers do it really well, right? I don't know enough about good drummers. <laughs> One of the reasons, I mean, you know, like piano players too, I think, to yeah. different end. Um, but maybe it doesn't have to be rhythmic in nature. Maybe it can be uh, a kind of just having two different, uh, uh, sending out, you know, commands to different um, size. Maybe if there's a, uh, some kind of, uh, some information has to get to the periphery to change color or something, you just have to send, you know, different information to different structures. Yeah, well, the interesting thing is you're quite right when you talk about the cephalopod nervous system being more distributed in terms of control. Yeah. But the problem is that that's the arms yeah. in terms of this three-fifths of the neurons being out in the arms. But the chromatophore system is controlled in the brain. The motor neurons are in the brain. So I'm afraid that doesn't work that we know of. Um, I guess the question then is, can, you know, let's say left uh, hemisphere motor uh, neurons, could, do they uh, project both to the left side and right side? No, at the level of the motor neurons, which is the chromatophoric lobe. Mm, it's completely lateralized. They, they are purely unilateral. I see, I see. Okay, and they've, there's actually the optic lobe, and then there's just sub esophageal, I think. There's, just, there's two lobes, and by the time you get to the chromatophoric lobes, as I said, a single projection. The other thing that seems to be going on that we don't understand, and this is also in the octopus, that we don't know about the squid, is that we don't think that they perceive what they produce, which is a little bit startling. So what, what do you mean perceive what they produce? <sighs> Well, we never have enough information. So when I'm giving you information, I'm giving you driblets from different animals, okay? But it looks as if cuttlefish, which do wonderful camouflage, and this camouflage has been very, very well explored as a perceptual system. But it looks as if they don't get any feedback about what they're doing, that the visual system doesn't monitor what the chromatophoric system produced. And it also looks as if, because from the chromatophoric lobe, there's no feedback to other levels of the system. So it looks as if there's two different ways in which they're not getting feedback about what they're doing. So there's no feedback to the... To right, the, it's open loop. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, but it makes it even more complicated. Okay, so we're running out of time for the inter-panel discussion, and I didn't want to leave that without... Um, uh, having some engagement about the sort of theory of mind uh, presentation. So uh, a question I had for Steve, but I'd also be uh, interested to hear uh, what Carol and Jennifer think um, is, so if you, Steve, were looking in other species other than monkeys, what, what do you think would be required to sort of convince you that a squid had theory of mind or um, a scrub jay or some other type of species? What, what, what do you think is a sort of definitive evidence that, uh, or the closest thing to definitive evidence that would persuade you? Um, for me, I think uh, passing a false belief task might be a good one. Um, and uh, rhesus monkeys actually fail at that. Um, Sorry, what's the test? Uh, it's like a you know, salient task. Uh, it's a famous uh, uh, developmental psychology task. Um, but the salient or false belief test is basically, um, you know, the idea is you're watching, um, you know, th there's two pots and I put something here and I left, but the things change. Yep. Um, you know, I wasn't there. So, you know, if you have a theory of mind, I should go to where, right? Where, where I knew it was, whereas, uh, if you, if the observer don't have zero mind, then he will always, he or she will always think that I will look here. Um, 
And in animals uh, in, or infants or young children, they use a, a looking time yes. to, uh, as a kind of surprise, right? Um, I feel like that's probably the one of the tasks that should uh, require. Um, yeah, but that's just, you know, most commonly used task, I guess. Yeah, so, so I think it'd be fair to say that passing a theory, uh, the Salian type task would be sufficient to show theory of mind. But do you also think it's necessary? Would you also claim that you have to be able to pass this false belief task in order to, to have a representation of uh, an unobservable internal state in, a, in another? Uh, that's a really great question because in order to pass that task, you also have to have uh, you know, motivation to care about, you know, finding, uh, matching that, because maybe you are aware of it, but maybe you're not expressing it. Um, uh, so I don't think it's uh, sufficient, um, but in social living species in groups, I think it um, uh, might be necessary. You, 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 you want to have that, but having that does not necessarily mean you have the full spectrum of this complex uh, term theory of mind, which is very hard to define. Because uh, theory of mind is just, you know, you know some kind of, pers you know, some information perspective from the others. Um, and certainly and false belief, I think, is uh, one good measure of that. Uh, um, but, you know, how that information is actually used to guide daily behavior uh, might require more of a, um, um, a decision making kind of style task. Um, Sorry, I'll take my. Oh, Carol, did you want to respond? Yeah, go. yeah. But I'm, uh, it, it's uh, the, the example you mentioned is actually quite close to what Debbie Kelly showed in her, her presentation about opinion jays who cash food and then retrieve it. And if there's another individual watching, they are very careful of why they where they cash and whether they cash at all. So, and that's suggesting that they are aware of what's going on. And there have also been experiments with, uh, with, with uh, script case, which is suggesting that they are aware of whether another individual has been looking to them uh, when they were caching and when they not were caching, and that affects their behavior. So if they have had an observant while caching, and then the observant is taken away, then you see that some of the birds re-cache. So they yeah. dig up the seeds and they store that somewhere else, when that other individual has gone, uh, suggesting that they are trying to to hide the new locations from that uh, other individual. What that, I mean, yeah, you can interpret it as a theory of mind, but what it actually means, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a complex behavior and they're definitely sensitive to the presence or absence of other individuals, other known individuals. Um, what's going on there um, in terms of how they think about it, so to speak, that's, that's hard to assess. The interesting thing is monkeys actually uh, pass that test too. Uh, monkeys are aware of what other monkeys are aware of. So, you know, they behave differently as a function of whether someone's staring at you versus when you're in, in someone's not staring at you, then they steal food and stuff. So those uh, kind of uh, cognitive abilities clearly there, um, but they just, for some interesting reason, they just failed this uh, uh, false belief, which is the, uh, I think the next level um, 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 uh, in the spectrum. In the cephalopods, what has been used to talk about this theory of mind is the idea of deception. And the information so far is casual. Nobody has done any experimental studies, but there's absolutely no doubt that, especially in the cuttlefish, one male can be maintaining a male-specific coloration, protecting a consort female from other individuals, and that another male can assume a female coloration and move in underneath, so to speak, his guard and mate with the female that he has been protecting without any disruption by the male individual. There's also, as I said, the, the information is so sad because you, there's the little piece here and this little piece here. There's a picture that one individual has of a male who I believe was evading a consort and, and this male who was evading the consort has 
an aggressive display towards the consort and what the observer said was a female display towards the female. So the bilaterality does come in in this. Now, whether deception is controlled in the cephalopods in the same way and with the same understanding as deception is controlled in the mammal of the birds, I haven't the faintest idea. But I think that this is a situation where if we had good experimentation, we could begin to find out. Okay, so um, let's see. I think uh, it's time to open it up to the crowd. Um, I will uh, uh, go over here to, uh, first and uh, please everyone feel free to line up. So go for it. Thank you. Um, I think in the summer school, there's something we didn't talk about enough, and that is, uh, let's say, the value or the importance of studying other species and understanding human behavior. And I think it would be interesting to have a discussion since we have a primatologist, uh, an ornithologist, <coughs> and I don't know how we call it, but someone who studies squids. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> so to me, it's more obvious uh, why we should study rhesus macaques to, to understand human behavior, but what's the value of studying the other species? And Carol, you mentioned uh, language. So how much of that can we use to, to understand human language? And same goes for squids, for theory of mind, for example. Yeah, right. So in, in, in um, comparative studies, if you want to understand something about humans, you can take two approaches. One is to study the closest relatives uh, because they're genetically related and they have this shared common ancestor in the not too distant past. So uh, traits which are present in us, you can expect that they are derived from traits which are present in the common ancestor with the great apes or uh, with primates more generally. Uh, so that means that if you look for the roots of certain behaviors, certain special features we have, that that might a good start be a good starting point. Now the other starting point is that you uh, discard the relatedness, but you look at behavioral phenomena in other groups and they might be completely unrelated, but would share particular features with the traits you're interested in in humans. Uh, and the idea behind that being that if these traits are really similar, that studying these might tell you something about what the mechanisms involved are, under what evolutionary conditions they might have arisen, what the function of these properties might be. So, and that's why you might study other species uh, rather than only very related species. So, I mean, again, the, you mentioned language, I mentioned that. Yeah, so if you're interested in certain aspects of language and how they might have arisen in humans, well, I mean, vocal learning is something which is very rare in the animal kingdom. It has only arisen four times in mammals, as far as we know, and something like four times independently in different bird groups. Um, and so, yeah, those few instances might provide a handle on why there is focal learning, how does it work, and it may give ideas about how it has arisen in us. It provides hypothesis, uh, but not proof in any case. Yeah, okay, because these few instances might have evolved in, for a completely different reason than for us, for example. So that's why I'm asking Conversely, how much of that. Yeah. Conversely, I would argue that it's very, very important to study animals who are intelligent from completely different phyla because if we're going to look at the evolution of cognitive abilities and intelligence, then we'd better look at different models because by definition, they have to be done in a different way. And I'm very, very cheered by work like that of Lars Chitka because clearly, it's not going to be enough to say, here we have the mammals and the birds and we have the Scala naturae. Oh yeah, there's out there, those are cephalopods, we don't understand them. And now we're beginning to be able to say, oh, there's the insects. And I think one of the things that we ought to be studying is spatial cognition because there are many animals from many different phyla that handle 
movement in space. Any mobile animal has to do movement in space. And I think we would learn a very great deal if we looked at many, many different phyla, many examples of how one handles the problem, not just of getting around in space, but of handling how you know about it. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, on the other <laughs> side here. Yes, uh, my question is about theory of mind. Uh, humans are very anthropocentric. Our theory of mind, we even put a uh, like human mind in animals. And you talked about the squid having a heterospecific theory of mind. I'm wondering, uh, is the inference made from their own predatory behavior and mind, or is that adjusted from species to species? Do they differentiate different kinds of minds in this heterospecific theory of mind? Did you, did you get my question? <laughs> did you understand? I think that both the way that information is handled and stored and retrieved and the kind of things that are important to animals will be very different from animal to animal. And, and I think that part of the problem with being humans is that we're egocentric and we want to think anthropocentric really and we want to think that we can understand what other animals are doing with information from our model. That said, I want to say that it's very difficult to try to think that the animal thinks differently. There, it, it's, the, it's the problem of being a human. We think like humans. So when I try to say, no, I shouldn't think like a human, it doesn't work very well. But I do try. Thank you. Hi. My question is for Professor Matter. Um, you had a short time for your second part of your presentation, and you talked about how squid m might have a language, but after that you switched to say that it's communication. So I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe just clarify a little bit on that, because how I understand it, um, when squid change their skin color or things like that, it's like signal, like to attract a, a mate, uh, mate, well, another, a female, for example, or to uh, to afraid another animal. So, how could you say that it's a language? I just don't quite understand. Okay, if I have it right, um, Moynihan said that he believed that squid might be making a visual language on their skin, and what he said was, in terms of the units, he thought that displays that had particular large areas might be the equivalent of nouns or of verbs. And that displays that happened in smaller areas, and I haven't had a chance to talk about this, but they all mix. They might be adjectives and adverbs that would modify the larger displays. Okay. The problem with that is if you look at Hockett's design features for language, that Hockett was very clear about characteristics which are not just a combination of this major display and this modifier and this major display and this modifier. And so what Hockett said, and I'm following the traditional definition, is, except for the ones like vocal auditory, which clearly don't apply, that it should be a commentary not just on self but a commentary about things happening around one in the environment. And so when I looked at the complexity of the squid skin display, it was absolutely clear that there's probably some modifiers. Actually, I, I showed this diagram of how you would take the units and come together to make a single display, and I think what's, what's probably happening is that some units of one display are being expressed at the same time as some units of another display, which is a very depressing thing to find out. But I think that the animal is always expressing about self. And so by that definition is simply a communication system about oneself and not a language. And maybe you could talk more about a language and what the true definition would be. Notice, by the way, that the bee dance is a language in the sense that it is communicating about the external environment. 
Um, can I ask a clarifying question? So who's the audience? Who's the known audience of these uh, patterns, mostly in squids? Uh, Self-expression. Well, the problem is that the known audience is, when they're mature, the known audience is other squid. But when they're immature, the known audience is fish. And so, for instance, this zebra display that I mentioned actually turns out to be shown to fish and shown to other squid. So sometimes there's a single audience, sometimes there's a multiple audience. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, my first one is uh, about the fact that we learned uh, earlier during the summer school that we should drop um, categorizing uh, species as to being either more intelligent than another species and so on. But we've been referring a lot to um, high level social uh, cognition and I was just wondering if we were kind of making the same mistake in terms of replacing one scale with another scale? And if we do that, uh, what are the implications on how humans treat uh, different species? So that's my first question. My second question has to do with some news of a couple of weeks ago, where we learned that at Yale University, the neuroscience department had um, come up with a system that was able to keep the brains of decapitated pigs from slaughterhouses alive. Now, my question is, are these brains sentient? Are they still pigs? Are they farmed animals? Or are they laboratory animals? I apologize for, op for opening this can of sentient worms. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I'll go after, uh, first try to answer the higher level social cognition kind of terminology. I absolutely agree with you. This kind of terminology can be very um, uh, yeah, misleading sometimes. Uh, I, for me, like cognitive, um, you know, maybe the best way to define cognitive is anything in between purely sensory and purely motor. Um, so, you know, I, I think. Uh, social cognition is just a you know cognitive operation in the social domain. Maybe that's the way to you know describe it. Uh, the word higher level is a is a very confusing term. I don't know how to explain it. Um, um, so um, yeah, so you know those terms are a little bit used more in the human social cognition research. I think. Uh, because I think maybe they're used a little bit more uh, in in line with how much abstract level of reasoning is behind uh, higher uh, high, uh, behind social cognition maybe that might uh, use higher but i absolutely agree with you this a uh, lot of terminology uh, can be um, 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 very confusing and terminology can be problematic because a lot of times you know how how brain operates things or computer information this terminology we use have you know nothing to do with it uh, it's, it's not like brain is speaking our own language, right? Uh, we're, we're just putting a descriptor to it. Um, um, but, you know, our, because we have language, and I think that's important, otherwise we, don't, we can only describe in numbers. So, uh, but uh, I agree with you, this kind of terminology uh, can be problematic unless you are precisely defining it. Yeah, I, I use the term higher order cognition, um, and uh, but I completely agree that um, it's a term which is dangerous to use. Um, the way I use it is in terms of, I mean, there are different levels of complexity, which, you've, as I just also mentioned with Chomsky, who really had a hierarchy of in his case, he started off as, as inform, informaticus. How do you say it? <coughs> anyway, someone uh, interested in computer languages and designing those. And then you can have different levels of operations. Some are more complex and mathematically defined, more complex than others. And that's the way in which I tend to use it. So you can only do one thing if you're also able to do the lower thing 
or, or the other thing, uh, and some and which animals can make that step and which cannot. Now the danger is, of course, that we then ascribe that as if they can do that in a particular context, that we tend to regard that as being more intelligent overall. And I think that's where the danger is. So there might be specific domains in which specific species may excel or be able to do more complex things than in other domains. But the situation might be completely different if you would look at a different type of behavior or a different context. So I, I, I really wouldn't like to rank the animals according to that. Now, I don't know whether you want to add something or whether we should go to your second issue. I, I agree with you completely that it is very, very important to think of the context in which the animal is using its cognition. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about it. So perhaps, but I don't think so, animals that are very social are more cognitively complex, and maybe they're not. <laughs> And what that reminds me of is the echinoderms that have no brain, but nonetheless have a well-organized behavior. And I don't know how they do it. As for your dissected out brain, I think a, there's only sentience if it's within an active environment. So I think, no, it's not. And I'll pass that to the others for their opinion. Yeah, I, I thought that was a very interesting issue you raised. Huh? So if you take the brain out of a pig and the brain stays alive, <clears throat> it, um, if it's still being able to perceive all sorts of input, uh, I mean, if it still has the eyes connected to it, for instance, something like that, then it would certainly experience something of the outside world. And so in that sense, yeah, I mean, you would also expect it to be sentient in some way or another. I mean, if, if it's the brain without any external in, uh, input possible, then you may wonder what it might actually still be sensing because it has no connection uh, to what's going on outside it. So it may still perform certain computations or certain processes, uh, but it, it, it has no relation to the outside world. So I think it's, a, it's, it's an intriguing topic, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what to make of it, but maybe you might. Um, so Jennifer mentioned um, that it sounds like she's mentioning the output might be required too. Is, yes. that, is that what you think? So that's an interesting question. Like, uh, do, you, do you need to re uh, respond to the surroundings to be sentient versus, you know, if you compute similar things, <coughs> process similar information without, you know, acting, you know, acting back out to the world, is that enough? Um, yeah, I, d I don't know the, you know, what, what's the process definition of sentience might guide one of these. I have no idea. If it's okay, I might comment on that. Second question, also just uh, because I, I remember the the reports were that the brain cells were kept alive, but there was no sort of neuronal activity. They weren't firing action potentials. So I think in that case, it seems pretty unlikely that uh, the brain was sentient, although it still raises a lot of sort of <laughs> disturbing questions about the future. Um, and maybe another type of case that sort of fits with what you're saying is um, uh, researchers are getting much more sophisticated about growing sort of in vitro um, sets of neurons, uh, and, and they're actually a really positive development in the sense that you can test sort of neurotoxins on uh, these neurons rather than on live animals. Uh, but you might ask, you know, is there a point at which, you know, the, these neural arrays get sophisticated enough where you would worry that there might be sentience going on, although there's definitely not any input and output in those cases. I think if you think about growing these arrays, you begin to generate a whole lot of really nasty ethical questions. And I don't know the answer to any of them. <laughs> you can go ahead. So, you know, there is a research, a field of research uh, that generates organoids, uh, brain organoids, and they use to test like um, um, Alzheimer's uh, plaque forming and stuff like that. You just grow, I mean, it, it doesn't look like a brain, but it, it, it has similar kind of 
complex neural connections and astrocytes and those kind of thing to make some kind of unit. Um, you know, but people, you cannot really test whether it's sentient or not because those organoids don't have any input or any output to the external world. Um, although, you know, they have neuronal activity kind of thing because they're, you know, alive and connected. Um, but, you know, unless there is a clear input to, uh, uh, if it's isolated, I don't think it's, it, can, it can be sentient because there's, uh, no beginning of the information transfer that are other than just uh, what's spontaneously occurring there. Yeah, I uh, <coughs> sort of, I, I hear that a lot and I, 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 I still kind of wonder, so I, I just to sort of raise this issue and uh, this idea that if there's not input output relations, then there must not be sentience. But if there, if there are arrays of neurons that generate spontaneous activity, um, I agree it's hard to sort of think what it might look like in relation to us that clearly do have input and output, but I, I don't know, it just seems like this, this idea that there needs to be input and output, I don't fully understand why that has to be the case. But. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, it, it, patients without any sensory input or motor output, they, they, they can be sentient. Um, um, but if the organo is developed without any experience of interacting with outside the world, I'm not sure what will be even the what will be even the reference uh, state they have. You know, then becomes uh, tricky. I think. Well, I think the locked-in patient who may not have any input and doesn't have any output, nonetheless has sentience because of the past. Right. You know, and, if the nervous system develops without any of the, uh, you know, coordination of sensory and motor and all this kind of thing during development, uh, without that, I don't think they, I don't think it will be possible to have, uh, like the cognitive states like we, uh, as we know, I guess. Yep. Um, yeah. They might have very different state, but uh, then then it becomes hard to even label what that is. But even the locked-in patient, in fact, they used. <coughs> eye movement and blinks to figure out that they were computationally capable within. So clearly they're not completely locked out from communication from output, which I think means that it doesn't follow. One of the things that would be very interesting to think about is that if we make these brainoids or whatever you might call them, what would ethics committees say if you said you were planning on making a sort of a brain? I yeah. have the suspicion the ethics committees wouldn't like it at all. I, I, yeah, that's kind of my question as well. I mean, I, I, I agree with that the idea that the, the brain organites that are developed now are not sophisticated enough that I think we would worry about them. But if they keep getting more complex, it, at what point should we start worrying? You know, if, if I, I would imagine yeah. if you had an exact replica of a human brain, you might think, uh, or... A I don't mouse think brain you get or a squid brain, uh, you, then you might start worrying about. Do we have an ethicist in the audience who can help us with this? You have them right next to you. My guess is that before organoid becomes like a functioning actual brain, I think machine intelligence will get there first. Hmm. Yes, but we don't control machine intelligence. No ethics committee that I know ever looked at, gee, you're trying to make a robot. Is that an ethical thing to do? We're safe there. Well, I bet there, I bet there are people are actually thinking about AI ethics, right? Uh, how yeah. you know there are a lot of a lot of committees forming these days because you know, like we're getting closer to the very high level uh, AIs now. Right here in Montreal, which is which has declared itself as the world AI city, there is a AI ethics committee on which I sit, but I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> What do they do and what would they control and what would they disapprove of? Okay, I, I yeah, find this a, we, yes. That was an interesting discussion, but we definitely Thank want to hear more. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I think one, one of the point of this whole summer school is to uh, answer the question whether uh, animals are sentient or not. And uh, I think I also think that one of or the point of it is to uh, to to give a juridic status of animals regarding to their sentience, 
So my question is for all of you. Um, how do you think you could use your, your work to, uh, to convince the law people, uh, people making laws, uh, that uh, animals should be given rights? How, could you, how would you use your work to convince them? Um, well, I think there are two issues there. I mean, um, one is the arguments to, to give that they are sentient. The other is the question of if they are sentient, whether they should get yeah. rights. Yeah, do you think your, your work can, can give evidence that animals are right. sentient? Right, so what... what, are, what yeah. How could you use this to, uh, to, to convince people that animals should have rights? Yeah, yeah. Um, so with respect to the first issue, uh, if you look back, uh, say, 50 years ago or even shorter ago, and you look at the, what the position of animals was in our society at that time, and what it is now in many countries, you see that there are dramatic changes also in, with respect to the laws on animal welfare, which are now present in many countries and the regulations for doing experiments with animals, which are continuously becoming more strict and more limited. I mean, limited in the sense of what we are allowed to do. Um, which is all based on increased knowledge, I think, about the abilities, the cognitive abilities, which are discovered in animals and the complexities both in the natural behavior and the complexities they show in experiments. And uh, I think that's, a, that's something which will go on. So in a way, I sometimes joke to people and say that the experiments I'm doing might make it impossible for my successors to do the same experiments because we are becoming more and more aware of what the animals can do. And that raises all sorts of questions whether you should continue with these sorts of things or not. Uh, so in that sense, I think that, yeah, I, I mean, if not directly, indirectly, the body of knowledge about the cognitive abilities of animals, which is growing and growing and turning out to be more complex than we previously thought, is having an impact on law. Uh, at what stage you should say, okay, animals have, yeah, I mean, you might say that that translates in animals having rights. And what these rights are is, I think, uh, another type of discussion, more of an ethical discussion. So how far should you, should you give uh, chimps a right, which are sort of like human rights, as some people are arguing, or shouldn't we go as far as that? And that's, I think, a different type of question. I absolutely agree. Um, um, and I think in some point, as we learn more about animals, there we're going to learn you know, more and more how sophisticated cognition is. Um, at some point, however, uh, at the legal level, there has to be uh, a decision to make in terms of um, you know, what's the balance between you know, all the medical benefits we might get from animal research versus you know, how sentient they are. I think that balance is a very interesting one because yeah, a lot of, you know, <coughs> medical advances requires uh, use of animal at some point. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's a kind of almost like philosophically speaking, like, you know, are we going to have to care about our own species a little bit more than the other species? Or should we just, you know, all species equal, even if we, sec uh, we you know, let go of some chance of curing our own species. Um, so I think that's a difficult question, and I'm, sh I'm sure bioethicists uh, are really struggling with this kind of ideas. Well, I think I mentioned yesterday that I think the utilitarian viewpoint is often used when we talk about how we will treat animals. And that what I see with some skepticism is that the benefit is pretty well all to us and the detriment is pretty well all to our animal subjects. So I think it's a bit hypocritical. You had 
Jonathan Birch, I believe, talking about the precautionary principle that if we don't really know, we should give the animal the benefit of the doubt. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to say, oh, these animals are sentient, so we should care about them, and these animals are not sentient, so we shouldn't care about them. It seems to me perfectly reasonable to give the best care and consideration we can to all animals. And I think this will happen, and this will make a difference to our attitudes to and our values of animals. And I think you're right, Carol, that we won't do studies in, say, 25 years that we now do, that I think we will be much more aware of what we're doing, who we're doing it to, who benefits, and to whom it's a detriment. Um, I want to just build off of this question a little bit, and I think this relates to your answer as well, Jennifer. So, um, so we can distinguish between what we think the sort of moral baseline is for um, having moral status, but um, there are, might also be sort of additional obligations that are based on certain cognitive capacities. So you might think that, well, if any being suffers, um, then we should try to not cause unnecessary suffering. Um, but some people have argued that there might be additional moral obligations we have in cases where um, a, a being has a sense of itself existing over time, right? So if, if humans have a sense of ourselves existing over time, that might mean we should not do things that sort of prevent, you know, caught, frustrate some of the things we want to do in the future. And so I just, I think that actually nicely ties into the, the different topics you guys have been studying because, um, there have been various philosophers who have argued that having a theory of mind um, is sort of indicative of having a notion of mental states and sort of having a sense of self, uh, like if you, you can see yourself in relation to others and that might um, add additional moral considerations. Um, having certain types of linguistic thought has also been linked to maybe having more of a concept of the self existing over time and some of the scrub jay experiments seem to have shown that maybe uh, crafty corvids might have things resembling this. So I'm just curious, do you, do you guys think that um, either abstract thought or having a theory of mind uh, might have some additional moral relevance um, beyond just um, sentience? Or do you think that these are sort of uh, not, not especially uh, directly connected to moral status? <coughs> Well, earlier Stephen was arguing that we have a set of terms that one person is replacing one with another and another person is using. I think we don't know the thing that we're talking about, so that makes it very difficult for us to figure out which one's different from which other one. I, I think there's a difficulty, however, between practical and moral judgments. So that if someone says, well, this particular animal species cannot perceive this stimulus or cannot is restricted in some way such that it's not a good idea that we should be doing this. I, th I think the moral extends further, and I'd like somebody else to think about that. I think the moral extends further than the practical judgment of what we can and can't do. Yeah. I, I, I... Well, I don't want to respond to the moral issue, but I guess Steve might might want to do that. But um, I mean, responding to what you said about uh, the cognitive complexity. So the point I tried to make earlier is that being having some complex ability in one domain not necessarily tells us much about another domain. Um, at the same time, it seems that some species, like humans, but maybe also corvids or great parrots that when they excel in one cognitive domain it uh, often i mean there are relations to also excel in other cognitive domains so if you may talk about something like general intelligence it might be present up to some extent in species like corvids or great parrots and uh, if that really is the case, then it should make us very wary about, uh, yeah, what we do with these animals. So they might, they might indeed, uh, being more vulnerable to the conditions under which we keep them and things like that. Uh, 
So personally, I, I'm, I mean, I've always been, in my lecturing, I've been advocating that, I mean, primates in the Netherlands, where I come from, it's for years, it's already banned that primates might be kept as pets. But a great parrot, you can still get and put it in a single cage and it stays there for 20, 40 years. And I think that, that I, I find that incomprehensible. I mean, their cognitive abilities are clearly at the level of primates. So I think that things like that, I mean, at least to, my, to me, uh, I think that that sort of level of complexity they show uh, makes me feel makes me feel or makes me think that uh, that they are not very well off in the conditions in which they're usually kept as pets or in captivity. Um, are you jumping the queue or should I go to the other side? I'm just continuing with the, with the uh, topic that was going there and it's going to be very brief. Okay. But it has to be said. Jeremy Bentham can't be quoted too often in this. We shouldn't make a cult of uh, animals' cognitive capacities. It's not how clever they are that's at issue, it's whether they can suffer. Yes. And in the hierarchy of abominations that we, and there's no other word for it, that we visit on animals, inflict on animals, Science is not at the top of the hierarchy. It's not the worst we do to animals. Um, the worst that we do to animals is what you're going to do when you go home and, and eat today. The, the working rule when we're talking about rights is, rights is a legal matter, but the working rule is if the animals can suffer, if they're sentient and they can suffer, <laughs> then you should not harm them needlessly. That means all of your gastronomic harm is unjustified, and that's the, that's the lion's share. The scientific side depends on, there's a conflict of interest there, and it's between our species and other species, and that's another issue. I would only add on the scientific side that you, uh, everyone should so, uh, search his soul as to whether the, the, uh, the uh, harm that he's doing to animals in the name of science is worth it. Sometimes it may be, often it's not. Often it's just curiosity, career, intellectual gain. We know that, it's, that's just as true of physics and chemistry as it is of biology, but in biology, sentience is at issue. Animals suffer and materials don't. Go ahead. Hi, I, I have a question on the artificial grammar learning. Uh, well, in Newman's IGL test, it's been found that the implicit learning process was done with no um, intentional learning strategies. Um, well, in such tests where the participants were asked to memorize a list of um, letter strings, they were able then to, um, to recreate the uh, the strings, but they could not and uh, explain or um, give the rule. And they also admitted that they used um, rules and strategies during the task, but again, they were not able to um, verbalize those rules. So I was wondering what this could tell us about the implicit learning. I know here it's in humans, but I don't know if we could do also analogy with the animals. Yeah, so, so if I got you right, you're referring to the, the, the uh, distinction between ex uh, implicit and explicit learning. So, uh, yeah, which uh, explicit learning is that we are very much aware or you're, 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 uh, you're told the rule which you should follow and then you can follow that rule and that's explicit learning. Implicit learning is what we do in our experiments. You show examples, and then from that examples, the rule is inferred. Um, now, I, I've been discussing with some people whether it's possible to distinguish in animals between implicit and explicit learning. I think that's a very tricky debate. So, um, in humans, 
the brain areas involved in implicit learning task and explicit learning tasks. There is a sort of a differentiation between these different tasks. And it has been claimed that in rats, in certain conditions, you indeed see that the areas which are related to implicit learning are uh, activated and all the tasks goes to explicit learning. Um, and it also comes down to this sort of procedural learning and, and, and well, other types of learning. So um, some people try to make that distinction, but, but uh, given that explicit learning really refers to what goes on in our minds, or uh, that, that we have this rule and we can verbalize it. I mean, that's, that's the way. <laughs> We don't, uh, if, as the animals can't express that to us, it makes that, it's very difficult, I think, to make that distinction in animals between implicit and explicit learning. You can only say, okay, there are different circuits involved in different learning tasks, and those circuits with us relate to explicit and implicit learning. But in terms of what the animal are experiencing in those situations, whether that's in any way comparable to what we experience, I wouldn't know. I haven't the cue. But maybe you, as a primate person, on explicit and implicit learning. Um, I think in monkeys, as well as in a lot of rodent species, um, people have been using the task design to kind of get at what's, imp uh, you know. To, to test implicit learning versus explicit learning. So it was at the, it, you know, like, because they cannot really tell us. Um, I think the behavioral design um, can be kind of tailored to probing uh, explicit versus implicit learning. And it's correct that, you know, there are different brain areas that tend to be more engaged for procedural uh, implicit learning versus ex explicit learning. Um, but you know, I think the the, the main innovation uh, coming from the animal research in this domain was using using very clean, robust, uh, clean behavioral design, uh, and use you know behavior output as a measure of learning. And if the animals learned from a you know implicit kind of learning task without any like explicit instruction or feedback. Uh, then you know you you have to infer that they must have learned, you know maybe not purely implicitly but mostly implicitly. So I think it really de it really depends on how you operationalize based on your you know task design to a lot of extent. Thank you. Um, and also this uh, morning, uh, Carol, you said in your talk that uh, animals, well, in fact, birds were um, sensitive to patterns. And uh, would it be correct to say that? animals, I think even human, are even more sensitive to irregularities, and that's what helps to memorizing or implicitly learning. Sorry, I couldn't hear your question very okay, well. If, um, if animals are highly uh, sensitive to patterns, do you think that they could be even more sensitive to irregularities? To what? Was irregularities. Irregularities. Um, what do you mean with what sort of irregularities are you? Like when there is um, a set of parent patterns to memorize, and then it's easier for the participant then to um, to identify like wherever was the the model with the irregularity. For example, if uh, I don't know, uh, um, I, I'm not sure whether I get your your question exactly. Sorry, but could, could, maybe, you, could you, yeah? Oh, maybe something to talk about after, and, or I don't know, uh, or you wanna? Okay, yes, I, I could develop this on the, on the blog and let's get more clear on it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, right. sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in music origins and oxytocin, and we know like from like recent evidence that um, oxytocin level are raising while humans are listening to music. I was wondering if there is first like uh, oxytocin like studies with birds. Like I would maybe like predict that snowball would be like having a rate, you know, raises oxytocin levels. Like it would be like higher if the tempo is like 
faster. And also, like, I have a second part of that question about oxytocin with uh, monkeys. I was wondering about the uh, Atari game uh, paradigm, if uh, the monkeys were playing while listening to the music of the game, and if so, uh, <laughs> it, it hasn't been has it been uh, tested with other music, like for background? Because I think maybe like competitive like behavior could be confused with play. It's just playing and uh, having like the same pleasure that music gives to the the, the monkeys, maybe like well. Uh, uh, so for your first sorry. part, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, my question is related to her, so maybe you all the panel can ask um, answer it together. Uh, Professor Cheng, you did mention, uh, you spoke, you talked about uh, uh, mirror neuron and um, oxytocin, and you also uh, commented that the scientific community may have overreacted to uh, the effect of oxytocin. So if you could comment on that while answering her question. Thank you. Yeah, about, uh, about um, a snowball dancing to the music, whether he I think it was a she actually, whether she likes that or not. Um, uh, and whether any oxytocin levels are changed in that, well, no one knows. That's the direct answer. Um, but there is another angle to that, and that is that um, if, you, if you have a bird and you like a zebra finch and we put it in a cage, and it may pack these keys, not for getting food, but it hears a song when it packs a key. Then we see that they are packing that key just to hear that song. That means that hearing that song must have some reward for them. So they must have some uh, pleasant feeling from hearing those songs. Otherwise, they wouldn't be exposing them to these songs, which is suggesting that there is something inherently, well, pleasant about hearing songs if you want to put it in that way. Just reacting to this, would you guys far that saying that maybe oxytocin is part of a proto-aesthetic sensibility? Well, aesthetic sensibility, well, uh, that's difficult to tell. I mean, uh, it's also the case that some songs are more attractive than other ones, and females, they are selecting, or in, some, in many species, females are selecting males based on their songs, and they are more attracted to some songs over other songs for good biological reasons. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe they perceive something aesthetically more attractive, but but I mean, I don't know. I don't know what they feel when hearing these songs. It's just that I can see their behavior and their behavior tells me they find this more attractive, more rewarding because they work harder to hear that or they go to that one rather than the other one in a choice test. And that's all I can say. I would say, so I believe it's the vasotocin in uh, uh, birds, right? Is it vasotocin? Um, oh, oh, is it vasotocin? Yeah. But my guess is that in that uh, scenario, um, the snowball will probably release more dopamine um, than oxytocin. That's just my guess. Um, um, and in terms of, um, I should also say, you know, when you measure uh, oxytocin levels, um, uh, from plasma, blood, or urine, or uh, saliva, uh, those are not really accurate measures of oxytocin because uh, uh, central nervous system oxytocin level and peripheral oxytocin level are not correlated. Um, unless you look, you extend the timing window so big, then it will be correlated. So there is um, uh, very tricky to know uh, the, the exact relationship. Uh, but my guess is that that kind of, you know, uh, moment to moment kind of uh, pleasure and uh, excitement is really dopamine uh, related. Um, um, and going back to the question, oh yeah, about it the, was, um, oxytocin, yeah. the hype, hype behind the oxytocin. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so when the oxytocin results first came out in terms of uh, cognitive ability, you know, until then there has been many, many excellent research on peripheral oxytocin, you know, all we know about lactation and birth. Um, but the, when the cognitive results came out, 
um, it people got really, really excited, uh, thinking that, oh, maybe this is the key to, for example, curing autism. Um, um, but what people have kind of brushed away a little bit uh, as, a, as a way of, you know, publishing and publishing and publishing and certain results are a lot of times, you know, first of all, what you see that are published, there are, you know, every single paper published, there are, you know, many that are uh, produce negative results. Um, and even the published ones, um, the effect size is really small. Uh, reliability is weak, uh, um, and uh, efficacy is weak. Um, and e even the, the, the reason that hype could have a negative effect is that you know after this kind of research, the parents are even you know buying this uh, oxytocin nasal spray from the back market, right, to <laughs> test it out. Uh, but again, you know, at this moment, we really don't know. You know, I mean. You know, if you try, it doesn't work, sure, that's fine. But we don't know the long-term uh, uh, potential harm in this kind of thing. Um, so there is, it, it just, you know, blew up really fast. And the uh, po uh, positive results bias was really big. Um, and now, you know, people are now even considering maybe a lot of oxygen effects we see could be due to vasopressin receptors which is possible, they cross bind each other. So there is a vasopressin clinical, uh, clinical trial going on. Um, and also, oxygen clinical trial, there are many out there. Some are good, some just didn't work. Um, so, you know, uh, I think, you know, it, it just requires a lot more work, um, and, but there's always a little bit danger when, when it reaches, before scientific community was uh, convinced by it, if it reaches the public so fast, uh, that can be dangerous. I think it reaches the public so fast because, you know, oxytocin, love hormone, uh, um, hugging hormone, you know, like it just became really catchy um, and spread really fast. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you were about to say something? I, I wanted to say something. I think we should be very wary of believing that nothing happens if we haven't put an animal in a narrow stimulus situation and rewarded it for the behavior we expected of it. We're really ignoring exploration and play, and we're ignoring the fact that animals actively go out in the environment and gain information for it, in many cases simply for the activity itself. And I think we, we don't want to get to the point where we narrow so completely that if somebody's experiment doesn't work, that animal doesn't know anything. Uh, by the way, octopus is play, which is very strange. Thank you. Um, I think next question was over here. Just a, a quick question for uh, Mr. Chang. Not sure if, if I heard it well, but I think you mentioned something about uh, Rhesus monkey's performance so with mirror self recognition tasks. Did you say that they only pad the test if we train them to do this task? And is this the some kind of limit case about the self Sure, test? I'll tell you about this story. So mirror neuron test, whether it's really valid or not, has been used for a long time uh, to test um, you know, the limit upper boundary of cognition. Um, and rhesus monkeys always failed. You know, they, if you put little dot here, and uh, you know, if, if, we, if I put a dot in a human, little circle color pencil that, um, and then, you know, you kind of get rid of it, right? But the monkeys always fail this. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, recently, well, not re maybe three years ago, uh, uh, a group kind of uh, pondered whether, because they failed it, because they just don't care um, about it. So what they did was they trained monkeys to pay attention to their face like, you know, using, using, uh, using mirrors. Um, but it was not, uh, it was not a direct, it's, the effect they saw was not a result of directly you train to pick and you get rewarded or something like that. But they just, you know, it, it kind of provide them an experience to pay attention to face. And then, you know, after that, they um, kind of, you know, pass the mirror test. But, you know, critics uh, are, you know, including me say that you know that the whole reason of mirror test uh, is has to be spontaneous um, so even the, even if there's a small training involved making them care more about what's on there that's already pushed the system you know to a certain level 
to maybe uh, pass it. So the question, I, I feel like a lot of question about this cognition has to be so much uh, in animal research, especially uh, something about spontaneous uh, is very important. Um, you can always train animals to do all these complicated uh, things and express all these high level social behavior. Um, but I think, you know, the real test is do they spontaneously do it? Yeah, but even if it isn't spontaneous, if we just test that they can be aware of themselves, they are aware of themselves at this moment, so they are capable of doing that kind of test. So they have a this capability, so. So the one possibility is that, you know, when they see a mirror uh, without training, uh, you know, they don't pass the mirror test, uh, suggesting maybe they're not aware that's them, right? Um, you know, but if they are a little bit pushed over to the uh, training a little bit, then they can do it. Maybe means that a kind of interesting suggestion comes out of there. You know, you know monkeys and anonymous primates might have a lot of you know basic mechanism to do this kind of uh, self awareness and stuff like that. But it's not just accessed, uh, just like what we we are, unless you you have to kind of teach the brain to do it. Um, so I feel like. You know, um, being able to sh exhibit uh, that kind of uh, beha cognitive um, behavior at the spontaneous level is more important in animals, especially because they're so easy to be uh, shaped and uh, uh, into certain behavior. And also, you know, just a little training can, you know, really change how same stimulus is processed, right? So, thank you. Well, I think the mirror test is a classic example of how you simply cannot generate an intelligence scala naturae, because animals who are going to pass the mirror test must have cognitive abilities past just being able to generate visual recognition. Okay, um, even a modified mirror test. Yes, back there, you want to stop us? Five minutes, okay. I'll be quick. Um, octopuses don't pass even a modified mirror test, but there's some indication that they might pass a chemical self-recognition test. And we just simply haven't bothered to think about any stimulus besides the visual ones. And I think many, many animals probably will pass a self-recognition test based on other kinds of stimuli. I absolutely agree. Um, and, and, you know, animals specialize in different directions and measuring intelligence tests based on human centric viewpoint uh, 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 makes us miss a lot because, you know, some animals go way down in the evolutionary tree to specialize in that degree. Well, if, if humans get tested in that intelligence test, human will probably fail. So, you know, I, I think I think it's important to I think it's important to note that you know, when it comes to intelligence, you know, we cannot test based on egocentric viewpoint. I haven't done it, but I would bet anything, anything that Greg Dudek can make a robot that can learn by associative learning to groom itself in a mirror. It wouldn't prove a thing. It wouldn't be self-recognition, it'd be just training. But I had a question for Carol that I, that I had to cut off because, uh, because of uh, the short time in the morning. Um, it was natural to look at, at uh, to want to look at species that vocalize because language is speech and we're looking for analogies. But um, it's not clear that that's the relevant comparison point. Um, and this is related also to mirror neurons. Uh, there are plenty of people who believe that the origin of speech was not vocal but gestural. And gestural communication is also a, a, a production, uh, a mirror system, if you like. And I wanted to ask you about that, basically. Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right. There are many theories about the origin of language. And one of them is that uh, the origin is gestural. And that's derived from the fact that great apes, they do have uh, gestures by which they communicate. Uh, and that might be quite sophisticated. Um, now, I'm not a fan of that theory, actually, because it uh, raises a, a range of different questions. So if we started off by using gestures to communicate a gestural language, uh, 
Um, then the question arises, what made us switch to vocal language? That's easy. Oh, well. Please use the microphone, Stephen. That's one of the... <laughs> There's a there's a, a slew of advantages over the oral uh, of oral over over gestural. And exactly. Have, so why no, because, has but, language? But it's not a good medium to start. It's not a good medium to start because in gestural you can imitate a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Vocally, all you can do is imitate sounds. Yeah. And so if the if the order of event was that that people that people mine things and then used it communicatively then once it became language it made it was much more effective to switch it then it, then the gestures become arbitrary and then they may as well be vocal with all the advantages of the dark and carrying things and far away well i i think we can spend an all evening <laughs> arguing about what you have just said and whether that's really uh, uh, there is really an advantage of starting off gesturally rather than uh, deriving it uh, language from oral communication. And there is primate work suggesting that um, one of the critical things is to combine sounds which refer to certain objects, uh, so referential signals, and combine that with each other. And uh, that's really a tricky part, and it doesn't exist in gesturing. There is no syntax to gesturing um, do we have time for one really quick question, a really short question? Let's hope it's short. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll mostly address this to you, Carol. Um, so uh, I'm a philosopher who mostly uh, brings animal cognition work into philosophy, and one of the pushbacks I often get when I present my work from other philosophers is they usually bring up the story of Clever Hans and talk about things like inadvertent cueing. And I, I noticed that you presented some of Irene Pepperberg's work in your uh, presentation today, um, and her controls are sometimes um, less strong than some of the other animal research. And so I was curious to ask you both, what do you do to avoid inadvertent cueing? Um, and uh, you can avoid this question if you want, but what do you think of uh, what Irene Pepperberg does, for instance, in avoiding that? Yeah, so in our work, the answer is easy. I mean, the birds are in a cage and everything is done by a machine. So the sounds are produced by a computer. It stores everything that the birds is doing. Uh, we have no interference with that at all. So yeah, there is no observer bias present in that case. With uh, Alex, that's a different story. So Irene Pepperberg, um, I think she, I know her quite well and her work quite well. And she is really being very much aware of the clever Hans phenomenon, so the cueing by the human experimenter. Um, she tries to build in all sorts of controls for that um, as far as is, is possible. But um, yeah, whether you can com <coughs> sorry, whether you can completely rule that out <coughs> in all of her experiments. Um, that's not really clear, but I think that uh, that some of them are really robust, and that Alex really has capacities which uh, go beyond what many other animals uh, have been able to do. Thanks. We probably should wrap up unless uh, Steve. So uh, let's thank our panelists one last time for excellent discussion. Thank you.